Okay, um, we are back, and it's time for uh, what we had earlier said will be our second hot topic, because our guest for the first hot topic is not available. But nevertheless, our second guest is available, Basil Abia. He's a research associate, Quacol uh, Research. Basil, good morning. It's good to have you join us on The Breakfast. Good morning. It's always my privilege to be on The Breakfast Show on Plus TV. Okay, so Nigeria risks U.S. market over on even AGOA utilization. That's the African Growth and Opportunity Act. And there are concerns that upon its aspiration in 2025, it may not be renewed. Talk to us about this development. Well, first of all, just uh, some background context. The AGOA uh, Act um, is actually a product of um, some very good thinking by George Bush during his presidency. And George Bush wanted an avenue where uh, products manufactured and processed in Africa uh, would find their way in the American consumer market. And it's a very large consumer market, uh, undoubtedly uh, not the largest in the world right now if we're discounting the consumption market um, of China. So it's, uh, and so that was a huge opportunity for African countries to take advantage of and be able to jumpstart their own in, uh, respective domestic manufacturing industries. Uh, unfortunately, very few African countries are taking advantage of that particular act. I know for a fact that Ethiopia is doing very well in terms of closing uh, and apparel manufacturing and they are taking full advantage of the Agua Act by shipping uh, most of those produce uh, over to of course, the U.S. Uh, consumer market. Uh, for Nigeria and a number of African countries, we have not been able to utilize. In fact, our utilization has been below average uh, over the last uh, 10 years, according to the statistics that are available. And um, we were when, and when I mean by we, what I mean by we is basically the African continent. We're very, uh, I wouldn't say lucky, but um, it was almost as if we're going to lose out on the Agua Act not being renewed in 2018 uh, due to some certain overtures by the then erstwhile American President, President uh, Donald Trump. Uh, but um, of course, he lost the election and, and Biden took over. And of course, the Agua Act was renewed again. Um, and that would definitely elapse by 2025. And um, even before then, uh, uh, that el el elapsed, there are a couple of African countries that are risking just losing out of the um, act itself. So there, there are lots of problems as to why um, Nigerian manufacturing companies, processing, uh, goods processing companies, and people who are in, in the agro processing uh, industry in Nigeria cannot take advantage of uh, you know that of Goa market one fact for me I think major thing is the quality control problems that we have a lot of that we put over yeah, in Nigeria. Yeah, branding, poor research and branding have been listed as part of the barriers. I mean that's what the experts say, and I agree with that. But I, I think for me, moving further um, is actually quality control because uh, a huge chunk of the goods that we are allowed to be able to to to. Uh, to ship over to the uh, American consumer market are actually food produce. And there are certain standards that the U.S. Um, FDA, uh, Food and Drug Administration, uh, Food and Drug Agency, have very high standards with regards to uh, regulations that we're not meeting, those food safety standards, you know. Uh, for instance, I, I know, for, uh, for instance, that we're supposed to uh, be able to ship seafood, our seafood, especially the very large shoreline that we have with the Atlantic Ocean. But we know we have structural issues like storage, for instance. Where's the cold storage infrastructure mm. to be able to do that? And for you to be able to carry out cold storage, you need power. Mm. And we're doing less than 5,000 megawatts every day, you know, in terms of power. People have to be able to spend um, ridiculous amounts of money to be able to power their diesel power gen so that they can be able to provide cold storage if they are indeed in that particular subsector. So, uh, when you look at your unit economics and your profit margins, you're not even making even. And when you're not making even, where are the incentives for you to say, okay, I want to engage in processing seafood so that I can be able to take advantage of the Agua Act 
and then ship uh, my processed seafood from the, the shores of the Atlantic Ocean, the Aquaibom State, to the food consumer market, for instance, in New York or in Florida. So these safety standards are, are an issue. And, and we see that. I know you've heard of, for those who do not know, uh, there are a couple of times when we have shipped um, tonnage, massive tonnages of, of, of beans, for instance, and the European Union into Europe. And the European Union basically rejected it because we had more than uh, normal uh, quantities of uh, Chemicals. certain insecticides yes pesticides. you know it's it's yes. interesting the pesticides. things you're saying i mm -hmm. i totally agree with you i'd spoken with a farmer uh bridget of Onogoa, i remember who said these same things you're you're saying and it, it does look like uh, these problems may not be going away anytime soon i mean there was a threat in 2018 that may not be renewed. It got renewed, and here there is also still the concern that come 2025, it may not be renewed. With the kind of power that we have and all the situations you've narrated, does it look like we're going to move forward from this? I mean, we are talking about how to move from consumer nation to a producer nation, yet these problems persist, and governments come and governments have been going and these problems are not fixed. Which way, Nigeria, is the next question. Basile, do you have an answer to that? Well, there are, there are always answers. I think what we have to look at is, first and foremost, look at the incentive structure for manufacturing. The incentive structure for manufacturing is, is look, it's not rocket science. We're not talking about something very difficult, uh, an esoteric subject. No, it's what are the modalities that are available to enable people in those industries have more intentionality about producing and exporting. First and foremost, they need power. Secondly, they need very friendly tax rates. Thirdly, they need access to foreign exchange because there are a couple of the raw materials that they need, even for the processing. For instance, the chemicals they will need for some of the processing. The industrial machinery to be able to expand their production unit when they are processing these produce. Don't forget, the core raw material is home. It's, it is home. If you are into seafood processing, your core mat material is basically the fishes by our water side or by our waterways. If you are into clothing, your core material, core raw material, is the cotton that you are producing in your cotton plantation in Katena or in Adamawa State, right? So the, we have the core raw material and obviously expand the production numbers so that we have higher tonnage, but we need certain structural issues to be sorted out and one of them is power we need to be able to generate as much power as possible to meet the very high demand we have a demand rate of about a hundred thousand megawatts domestic demand for power is already about a uh, hundred thousand and we have found a way to plug back those numbers uh, just about eighty thousand megawatts is what we produce every day from diesel and uh, uh, fuel powered gen cell generation so we're producing 80, over 80,000 megawatts of cell generation, but it's not sufficient because the, the raw material to power those cell generation units are the PMSs and the, uh, and the diesel. And the prices, the elasticity, elasticity of the pricing is very volatile for your planning if you're a manufacturing, for instance. I mean, you wake up one morning and a liter of diesel moves from over 190 naira to over 860 naira. It happened last year. So imagine you being the accountant of that manufacturing uh, company. You have to do a lot of downsizing, cutting here and there, and it, it hemorrhages your production units because you have to sack some people, right? And when you sack some people, you have to also reduce the units that you're, you're, you're using, the raw materials that you're accessing to be able to produce. And we had the situation where there was data from the Manufacturing Association of Nigeria sometime last year where they said over 80% of their members downsized by 50 percent and that downsizing might be sacking it might be a reduction in production hours it might be saying okay we're only producing from 8 a.m to 2 p.m because there's only a limit to which we can um, um, buy our diesel and power our gen so all of these structural issues we need to look at these and sort out these supply side constraints when we're able to sort out these supply side constraints i promise you Government has no business giving money to manufacturers or saying we're doing tax rebates. No. Once there's a unified tax rate for manufacturers and industries, they are not paying as much as 40 taxes 
local uh, government taxes, state government taxes, even the uh, bond at the bow side are also taxing them. You know, when they are not having this to face these issues, when they have power that meets their demand, they are ready to pay. They are ready to pay. I, I was a researcher in 2019 um, for a particular project, the willingness to pay for electricity project in Abuja, and our findings were very overwhelming. 80% of our respondents said they were willing to pay more for electricity. They were willing to. So Nigerians are actually willing they to had pay it. more for electricity. Yes, but do now, we unfortunately, have to be unfortunately, Basile, it's not just Nigeria yeah. that is not taking full advantage of this Agoa window. Uh, other countries in Africa have also been said to be failing in this. This huge appetite for import and lack of uh, the willingness and, and tenacity to be able to produce our own in such a way that we can also go out there and sell and make revenues. Why are we having this so much in Africa? Yes, again, it boils down to my initial question. Energy poverty, power, I mean, my initial contribution. We have, Africa is energy poor. Um, more than 60% of um, Africans do not have access to reliable electricity. We have the highest rates in the world of people that are not connected to an electricity grid. You know, the African continent, for instance. Manufacturing industries. Yet we have um, enough to give ourselves more than enough power, energy, and even export. Why haven't been able? Why haven't we been able to make the most of it? Structural issues again. You know, we have to we have to look at these things uh, from a holistic perspective. For you to be able to provide the governance needed to structure all the boats, all the units for electricity to be reliable. You need structural governance, and we don't have that. Look, even the biggest, the most industrial African country, uh, South Africa, has serious electricity issues. Yeah. You know, one of the currently they are going through their worst energy crisis ever in their history. You know, um, it, there's what they call uh, when we, in our etymology as Nigerians, we call it uh, blackouts. They don't call it blackouts. I've forgotten there's a particular word that they call it. But they're going through that right now, um, where they, you know, certain regions have to go sometimes 12 hours, sometimes as much as 18 hours without electricity. You know? and it's unfortunate what's happening. Zones. It's unfortunate what's happening to South Africa because we used to use South Africa as a reference point that they had more, they generated more than they could use, and and, and our population was much larger than theirs. And here we are seeing them having the same problems. Yes, again, because they are not, um, they're not working on uh, improving their infrastructure, their power infrastructure. They have very obsolete power infrastructure, by the way. It's largely coal powered. And as you know, um, even with the coal powered uh, infrastructure that they have, most of these plants are no longer functioning at optimal capacity. So they are not building uh, newer. Uh, power plants, the speed in which they're building newer plants is not enough to meet demand. They have a larger population now than 20 years ago. And if you look at it, if, if you look at their numbers, they're still producing a lot of power. They produce more power than any, every single um, um, African country. But it's just that their demand levels are super high, so their demand supersedes the supply side uh, for their uh, electricity uh, provisions. So a lot of these, again, still back again to the structural issues. And it is not rocket science what I'm explaining. I'm just saying that all of the impediments uh, towards having optimal supply capacity are, are there. They're still existent. Once you remove all of these impediments or these hurdles, mm. things would move faster. Things would move more optimal uh, in terms of capacity. And then you would now start to see um, uh, um, expansion of productivity. Unfortunately, because we're not concentrating on solving these issues, we're still going to talk about this for years to come. Yeah, which is quite unfortunate. I'm bringing it back to Nigeria. As I said, I had spoken with a, a farmer, a female farmer, who told me that some of the problems that you know, the agri sector in Nigeria is going through and how that oftentimes in trying to export produce from Nigeria, farmers encountered problems because the pesticides used were either too much and all of that. And then you begin to ask yourself, in fact, she did say 
that the African shops, the African supermarkets you have outside of this country, the most of the goods you find there are not even from Nigeria. And I was quite yes. alarmed. Yes, of course. Agree. Because yeah, you, instance, you go to these African shops and you, you will see things, almost everything we use here in Nigeria, and you, you will think that it came from here. The yam, the egusi, and the rest. And then to learn from Bridget when I did that they were not from Africa, Nigeria. We they quite, weren't from uh, Nigeria. And you, you can talk about many produce. For instance, um, I carried out a project for uh, a private client. Uh, they wanted to invest in a, uh, a processing plant for shea butter. It, it, permit me to say that most of the shea butter that you get in Europe, um, even though they're actually produced in Nigeria, because we're the largest producer of shea butter, for instance, yes. in the world. Um, that is a fact. Um, however, because we have very poor processing uh, and safety standards, uh, food safety standards with that shea butter, which is a very sensitive produce because you're using it on your skin. And you know the regulations in EU are very, very tough and stringent. Mm -hmm. Everything has to pass through Ghana because Ghana has more infrastructure for that particular shea butter processing oh ecosystem. So they have a very good shea butter uh, uh, processing ecosystem, what they do is they have folks in Nigeria, particularly in Kwara State and in Kumbi State and in Niger State, where they ship the raw produce of shea butter and send it over to Ghana. In Ghana, they do the processing and the packaging, and then they send over to the European markets. And the demand for shea, Nigerian shea butter is very high. But they, again, uh, we're losing more than 80% of the potential profits that we're supposed to get because we don't have the infrastructure for processing. And it's because of the structural issues, you know. Uh, the yam, for instance, in your average African shop in Europe, the yam actually comes from Ghana, but the yam is actually planted in Nigeria because they don't have enough uh, uh, production capacity for yam. We are the largest producers of yam um, in the world, you know. We are also the largest producers of cassava in the world. But most of these things have to pass through Ghana, where there's some semblance of processing, meeting up with the EU uh, uh, pesticide uh, level standards, food safety standards that they have, these countries have. And the EU, of course, has this block of bureaucratic uh, structure where they are in charge of the uh, produce quality that comes into their their, their markets. And they, they do not relent on that. And we already have a notoriety. Uh, Nigerian produce, food produce, we have a notoriety for uh, uh, not meeting those standards. So. Uh, nobody wants to be able to get uh, the, the commodities from Nigeria. Instead, they prefer if they get the commodities oh, from, um, from Benin Republic or from, from Ghana because they have better standards, adherence uh, systems that we do not have. So we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot Basil, of work to do. But you know, when listening to you, one begins to wonder... Who are those who are supposed to have fixed these things? We have the Ministry of Agriculture and other ministries that should Ministry be in faith. charge, should have fixed. You know, I'm speechless right now. Can you please speak up from where I stopped? <laughs> Who are those that should have been fixed it all? Uh, I mean, look, look we, we, let's, we have a, a serious elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is not going to be solved by private sector interventions. I'm sorry to say it. You need government to be able to carry out a lot of these adherent systems. Um, and we have new ministers. I think the ministerial list, uh, the first half of the ministerial list just dropped yesterday. So we're going to have potential new ministers in the next one month or two months that will be sworn in. Um, their first point of action, especially if you're the Minister of Trade and Investment, and you're also the Minister of Agriculture, yeah. the first point of contact is to meet up a standard organization in Nigeria and find a way to overhaul and revamp our safety standards and adherence structure. And we already have very good laws. The laws that we already have are very good. The legislation that we have are very good. Just ensure that there is a very high adherence. I think system. the starting when point is, would be to see to it that those who are put in charge of those ministries know what they, that they should be there, that they are qualified to be there. Not the same things that we've seen in the past. The former minister of education who knew nothing about education that was there. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, Mr. Arabushala also said the same thing of himself, that he knew nothing about the portfolio he was given. So we need people, the round, you know, people, the, the perfect people in the right positions who knew, who know what that position or that office requires of them, who are qualified, Absolutely. who are in that field. 
Yeah, yeah. We need we need square pegs for square holes. Mm -hmm. we, we we need uh, round pegs for round holes. We just need to be able to do the right connection, the bolts and holes, and connect them uh, right. And, and they're not hard. They're not hard. We just need people who have the political will and the know-how. And once they have the technical know-how and the political will, they would structure it. You know, uh, for instance, imagine the context where someone really wants to revamp how we do our exports and he takes charge of the trade and investment ministry. First thing you're doing is overhauling the operations of the NEPC, yeah. Nigerian Export Promotion Council, to make sure that all of the modalities needed to make exportation very easy in the Nigerian market are fixed. And when they're fixed, we no longer have people who are working for NEPC but have never actually come in contact with exporters or food manufacturers or even our farmers. They have a lot of people in the NEPC, and no offense intended to the people who work for the NEPC, but we have a lot of them who have spent maybe eight, nine, ten years in their very gross office here um, uh, in Abuja and never actually come in contact with these actual exporters to find out what are the impediments to why they are not exporting the volumes that they should export, why their produce are being rejected in the European Union mm -hmm. or in the American consumer market, you know. And then fix those impediments. When you're able to fix those impediments, then, I mean, would have our exportation numbers higher than they are. And we should be doing far much better than we're currently doing. Yes, it is important that we're having this discussion. I think even at this point in time, as the first list of ministers are coming, the portfolios are not yet known. But, you know, now that we're talking about the need to have square pegs and square holes, it is very critical that if, if, if we're going to move forward, there's just no other way else we can't continue business as usual we need to fix this country i mean uh, we, we 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 just we can't continue as you know business as usual but still thank you so much for being a part of this discussion this morning it's always a pleasure to have you discuss with us always a pleasure to be on course tv africa thank you very much for the time all right, so we'll take a break now and come back for sports. Mudashi Rishitu is standing by to take you through the world of sports. Stay with us. <laughs>